Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this lovely summer day to uh, <laughs> pediatric uh, grand rounds. Today, our speakers are Andrew Tressler and Keith Little. Andrew Tressler is the Director of Chaplaincy Services for Corellia and Clinic. He earned his BS in Religion and a Master's of Divinity in Pastoral Counseling from Liberty University. He is board certified through the Association of Professional Chaplains and has been with Corellian for seven years. When he's not at the hospital, he spends time reading and hiking the Blue Ridge Mountains with his wife, Lauren, and his dog, Fitzroy. Our second speaker is Hales from Raleigh, North Carolina, Keith Little. He, is, he earned his undergraduate degree from North Carolina State, his Master's of Divinity from Campbell University Divinity School, and completed his chaplaincy residency at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. Prior to that, he worked in the automotive industry and serves as a hospital chaplain since 2002 and with Carillion since 2016. Uh, he covers the oncology palliative care units and several vet service units. He is a cancer survivor and he says serving as a hospital chaplain is a dream come true for him personally and professionally. Please join me in welcoming Andrew and Keith. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome on this uh, quite chilly day. And my name is Andrew Tressler, Director of Chaplaincy for Carillion. Thank you, Dr. Parmchuar, for inviting us many months back and setting all of this up. Uh, Dr. P and I were in uh, peaks together and got to know each other really well through that process. And then I got to hear her speak really authentically through uh, the med school graduation last year and uh, is an incredible, incredible speaker uh, and a wonderful position and, and part of the team here. Uh, and we tend to run into each other at every community festival uh, downtown, which I love. I wanted to, to start out, um, and I know this is kind of a, a hybrid group, and so we'll be um, trying to get some interaction this morning, and we just want to start, has everybody here uh, had some interaction with a chaplain with through Carillion. Uh, perfect, perfect. Um, and then the, the second piece of, of interaction is: Does anybody know the qualifications of a chaplain for Carillion? There, there is a kind of wide variety uh, across the nation of. Uh, qualifications and as you get into the acute care setting like Carillion you get uh, uh, learning objectives before we get, get a little bit ahead of myself uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about the qualifications of a chaplain uh, clearly defining religion and spirituality uh, highlighting the importance of holistic patient and family care I want to leave you all with some spiritual assessment tools uh, for your practice and Keith and I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest in the material presented today. Qualifications specifically for a board certified chaplain. Uh, we have a four year undergrad and then a three years Masters of Divinity program is kind of the uh, gold standard. And then we go through 1600 hours of what we call clinical pastoral education and that is done in the hospital setting. Uh, they try to model it in the, the residence style. We, so each unit is 300 hours of clinical work and 100 hours of education in classroom work. And then once uh, those units are done, you get 2,000 hours of post-clinical work. Uh, and then the certification process with the right to 31 competencies, um, two clinical contacts, and then present that to a board of already certified chaplains to show and, and demonstrate demonstrate competency. And so Carillion has 24-hour in-house coverage for Ronan Memorial Hospital for the chaplaincy. So there's always somebody in the building and available uh, for pediatric golds, traumas, I guess we don't call them golds anymore, pediatric traumas, uh, blues, family situations that kind of kick up in the middle of the night. And then our community hospitals, we have a mix of community clergy and telechaplaincy from our Rona Memorial chaplains. And so there's this kind of blanket of coverage uh, that we try to uh, always make spiritual and religious support available to our patients, families, and staff. 
So then looking at definitions, and, and what are we talking about when we talk religion and spirituality? The, the two pieces that uh, we try not to mix into work are religion and politics, and part of Keith and I's job is to talk about one half of that, so I try to avoid the other half uh, like, the, like the plague. Um, but when talking about religion specifically, uh, we are talking more of the, the traditional structure of what people think about when they think religion. Uh, so a set of beliefs or rituals, practices, typically involving some sort of institution or organization. Uh, it can be personally held beliefs, uh, but typically when we think religion, and, and for today's topic, we're talking kind of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, uh, Islam, Judaism, Sikhism, kind of these kind of traditional organized religions. And then spirituality, this definition comes from the American Association of Medical Colleges. In 2009, they, uh, a group, sat down and, and tried to define what spirituality is so we can try to, our best to teach new physicians and, and new folks going through med school, uh, teach from a singular definition. And so uh, they say that spirituality is an aspect of humanity that refers to the way that individuals seek and express. And, and that to me is, is the most important piece in how they seek and express meaning and purpose in the way they experience their connectedness to the, to the moment, to self, to others, nature, the significant or the sacred. And, and so when, when talking spirituality, I jump to kind of really broad definitions and some of the most spiritual people in my life have been folks that gather either early Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon around a tailgate with beer and some buffalo chicken dip, <laughs> sports fans, uh, deeply, deeply spiritual people. Uh, they've got specific rituals. Season ticket holders have sat in the same spot wearing the same outfit, one sock pulled up, one half down because 15 years ago uh, their team won on a last minute Hail Mary and you know they are praying to the sports gods to show favor again we're, we're getting into uh, the nfl playoffs uh, my wife is a cowboys fan born and raised in dallas and, and just heartbroken all over again uh, season after season after season <laughs> uh, but teams have songs that they sing they've got chants that they scream out and even some version of iconography we, we talk about the the goats the, the greatest of all time and, and who's on your sports uh, mount rushmore uh, the Tom Brady's, the Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky's, uh, Serena Williams, Tiger Woods, uh, these kind of icons of sports transcend and, and really some uh, worship of, uh, of teams, of people. And so spirituality can be as broad as we allow it to be. And so I really like Brene Brown's definition of spirituality. And this is out of uh, Atlas of the Heart, one of her latest books. And she says that spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us. And that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. And so with that, we've transitioned into a place of, of cultural sensitivity uh, that, that my team, the chaplains, through Roanoke and through our profession are uh, bound by some ethical standards to, to not push our faith or any particular faith on the patients and families that we're working with. Uh, we serve under the umbrella uh, with Dr. Bishop with, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and so that's a really important piece for me to, to just put out there on the, the front end. Um, particularly cultural sensitivity in healthcare is crucial when dealing with spirituality. Uh, because individuals' spiritual beliefs are often deeply intertwined with their cultural values and backgrounds. Understanding and respecting diverse cultures and their perspectives on spirituality is essential to providing really patient-centered care. Cultural sensitivity ensures that healthcare professions acknowledge and honor the unique ways in which individuals express and experience spiritual beliefs. We do not need to be experts on every faith tradition in the same way that we don't need to be experts on every disease process. It is okay to, to pull in other experts. We have a, a wide variety of faith leaders in the area that make themselves available when there is a specific need and a specific request. And my team works with patients 
um, from, from a variety of traditions. And, and we worked with a Norse pagan who transitioned to comfort measures and his desire was to die with a sword. Part of his tradition, something that was really important to him. And the staff kind of freaked out. It's like, absolutely not. We can't have a weapon in the building. And uh, they consulted us and we worked with security to come to uh, some sort of mutual understanding of what the need really was, <clears throat> what the request uh, meant and how we could do that and, and honor that request uh, in a manner that kept everybody safe and kept everybody informed. We work really closely with the Jehovah's Witness liaisons for things like blood with surgeries. And I met with them a couple of weeks back in December and they shared with me a story out of uh, Chicago where uh, somewhat recently in the last couple of months, there was a bloodless heart transplant, which kind of blew my mind. Um, but there is a specialty clinic that specializes in really complex of the surgeries in Chicago. And they worked with this patient for months to prepare her body the best that they could. And uh, she is now uh, in, uh, in a place of recovery. And uh, they were just so thrilled to, to be able to share that story with me. So, so acknowledging uh, that, that we don't, I don't know everything about the Jehovah's Witness tradition, but I've got those connections and we work really closely with them. And so spirituality research, uh, Keith is gonna get up in a little bit and talk a little bit more specifics on some of what we do. Uh, and so we are a little time limited. And so I'm gonna kind of skip the specifics of the research and maybe get invited back one day and, and dig a little bit more into these things specifically. But wanted to put two people on you all's radar, Harold Koenig and Christiana Polchowski are uh, the two kind of juggernauts in the spirituality and medicine world. Uh, Dr. Koenig is with Duke's Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health, and Dr. Polchowski is with the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Health, uh, and are the two leading experts in all things spirituality and medicine. Uh, they've put out hundreds of articles, and both have uh, published books, and are phenomenal, phenomenal speakers. Uh, I'm happy to point you all to some, some great research that they've put out. Uh, and just last week, when I was uh, finalizing this presentation, I jumped on NIH's uh, Library of Medicine. In the last five years, they've got 4,100 articles on spirituality and health. Um, and uh, we are happy to explore potential research opportunities with, with you all. I'll drop a little plug there. Uh, there are some grant opportunities with the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, and Dr. Music and I with the med school are sitting down, I think next week, to talk about potential opportunities. And so we're always looking for those things. Um, Rush University of Chicago uh, employs at least two full-time chaplaincy researchers in spirituality and medicine. And then VCU has one, Kelsey Whiting, is uh, the editor-in-chief for the Journal for Pastoral Care in Health, I think. And so then looking at assessment tools for you all. So these uh, FICA and HOPE are spiritual histories or assessments that were developed by physicians for physicians to, to be able to uh, nail down really pretty quickly where a patient or their family are spiritually and what helps bring them hope and support. At Carillion, our kind of big broad question to, to capture some of this data is are there any spiritual, cultural beliefs, religious practices, or values that will affect your care with us today? And then if they say yes, then we will ask them a follow-up question to describe those beliefs and how it will impact their care. And then the final question is, do they want a chaplain, do they want a pastoral um, leader to come make a visit? And so those are really kind of broad pieces. I'm a big fan of the HOPE assessment. What provides you hope? Is there an organized faith tradition that you're a part of? Are there any personal spiritual practices that you're involved in that may impact your care? Or not being able to do may impact your, your overall wellness. Being in the hospital, isolated, uh, not being able to get out into nature if that is part mm -hmm. of their spiritual practice. And then, are there any end-of-life choices that we need to, to be aware of in your faith tradition? 
and when I step in and and we often don't know their spirituality, I'll ask really broad, open-ended questions like, in difficult situations in the past, what's been helpful for you? It can start really broad and then kind of narrow in from there. And oftentimes we'll get answers like, family, friends, church, pastors, hobbies are, are what support me. Uh, and then kind of help them tap into those resources. And so my roots uh, stem from uh, the non-denominational Baptist background. And in, in my tradition, we love our three-point alliterations. Uh, and so comfort, clarify, and challenge. Uh, and so this is kind of what our goals are as chaplains. And so the first is comfort. And our goal, my goal, is to do this every day and live out the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story goes that a man was beaten and robbed and passed over by others. And the Samaritan stopped to care for this person. He was bandaged and taken to an inn to recover. And we see similar stories across faith traditions to love your neighbor, uh, a call to care for those that are hurting. And this is a lens that I view all of my patient and family interactions through. I'm not their pastor, I'm not their primary caregiver, and often I'll have just a single interaction with them before they're either discharged from the hospital uh, or another chaplain will step in to continue that care. And so my goal is to help be a light in the midst of the, their most difficult days and to help point them to just a touch of hope if I can. And the impact can be hard to measure in the moment. And, and there are days that I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. And I've got a, a stack of notes in my office that I will turn to uh, from families and patients expressing their gratitude and, and what those moments meant to them. Uh, and, and that's part of where my hope comes from. And then the second is to, to clarify. What, what do they believe? How is that helpful in this moment? Or how is it not helpful? Um, the spiritual care in the hospital is assessing and clarifying what specifically they believe and whether they're willing to share that with me or not. There are times where if somebody doesn't want to see a chaplain, we are sometimes viewed as the angel of death, particularly in the ED. You know, if a chaplain shows up, something terrible has happened, which isn't always necessarily wrong, um, and, and we try uh, to soften that as much as we can. And the last one, and, and this one is really only when necessary to, to challenge their, their views or, or push it back a little bit, and, and this really comes in when, when talking about what we would call miracle talk um, or when, when patients or their families cling to their diagnosis as their identity. And we, we see this a lot in the adult world with cancer survivors in this, uh, my name's Andrew and, and I, you know, I, I, I beat cancer. And, and how can you help show them that they're so much more than that? You know, I'm still a husband, I'm, I'm a rock climber, I, I can be more than just a diagnosis. And so when trust is built and there's a little bit of a relationship, there are times where in the miracle talk world where I may ask something like, what if, what if God doesn't bring the healing that you say is going to happen? What, what, what does that do to your faith if the answer is no? Um, and then there are often times where we'll get to a palliative care situation and, and the same kind of talk will come up. And, and to me, I'll ask questions like, you know, we've, we've talked about their view of heaven or, or some version of an afterlife. And, and knowing what you've shared with me, what if that healing that you say is coming is coming in whatever is next for your loved one? And, and just kind of explore that with them, not, not to, to push, uh, not to push hard, but to, to gently kind of uh, encourage them to take a hard look at what their beliefs really are and how that works uh, in their current situation. And so I'm going to end my piece with uh, Viktor Frankl's quote, uh, man is not destroyed by suffering, he is destroyed by suffering without meaning. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, and uh, between that and Ellie Weissel, in, in his book, Night, uh, he was 15 when he was first uh, put into a concentration camp. So he, he would have been a pediatric patient. And 
and he says that I've not lost faith in God. Uh, I have moments of anger and protest, and sometimes I'm closer to God for that reason, uh, that, that protest. So I'm going to transition to uh, Keith Little, the pediatric chaplain, to talk a little bit more specifics on the pediatric world. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen today. Do I advance my slides or were you advancing the slides? I'm advancing the slides with the keyboard. Got it. Morning. 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 Thank you for having us. <coughs> Um, I'm going to jump right in. Healing as a spiritual activity. Um, all healing is spiritual in our world. Um, throughout the variety of world religions, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and shamanic traditions, they all see the project of healing as intersecting with one's spirituality and religious identity. All of us are here, especially through the hospital system, for one goal. Healing. Um, we all bring different tool belts, but we all are coming at the same issues. Um, and uh, I would just like you to know that anytime that I'm invited to pray with a family, with a situation, almost always, almost always, I pray for three things. Um, number one, uh, I pray for you. <laughs> I really do. I pray that God reveals things to you. I pray that your eyes are open so that you can see actually what's actually happen happening. Um, I always pray for healing and rest, physical restoration, if it's at all possible, or it's as close to it as we can get. Um, and I pray for the family and their emotional and spiritual strength to persevere. Because obviously we know that, especially when you have children in the hospital, there's no worse day than that. Um, but in pediatrics, that craving for healing is ever so much more raw, visceral, soul-wrenching, and literal, literal desperation. I've worked a lot in the adult world, now I've worked a lot in the pediatric world, and obviously everybody wants healing everywhere, but in the pediatric world, it is so much more, so much more intense, and thank you for what you do. Did I just hit, which button? Good, ah, oh, sorry. Thanks. Spiritual coping. Spirituality can provide positive coping strategies to different interpretations. Of suffering and illness as well as feeling additional support from the faith community and God um, but also spirituality may present negative coping strategies through traditions that overly emphasize guilt and religiously sanctioned prejudice hatred and violence religion and spirituality should be a source of comfort peace community and inspiration in your life if that's not the case you could be experiencing spiritual abuse spirituality is a double-edged sword uh, it can be weaponized one of the Ten Commandments states that children should honor their mother and their father, but that can be twisted and used against the child. Signs of spiritual abuse are manipulation, bullying, shaming, or using religious texts or beliefs to justify abuse. We've seen physical, sexual, financial, all throughout pediatrics, we know. Um, I've met people who have experienced spiritual abuse it makes it that much more difficult for them to use their spirituality to cope with an illness. That tool is kind of taken away from or twisted or robbed a little bit. Um, before we can effectively cope with an illness, we're trying to undo the damage that has already been done to their spirit. Now, any case of abuse is a strike against our, their identity, and we need to help heal that as they try to work with everything else that's going on. Um, and obviously after abuse, people get mad at God. Uh, what was done in God's name? Why didn't God stop it? Maybe God even sanctioned it. So people are dealing behind the scenes, obviously, in their heart of hearts. People are dealing with a lot when they're going through things like that. And we step in and we go, we're guides, pathfinders at the best, healers at the best. Medical decision making and a study of parents making decisions for their children in terms of life support. Parents saw their experience with the child's illness and their role in making decisions as a spiritual experience and a way for the family to live by means of faith. In other words, medical decisions can be an expression of living out their faith. In the best case scenario, it can be a beautiful thing, but it can also be heart wrenching to witness. I've seen loving families never accept the reality of a terminal illness and claim religious language that God will do the miracle for us. I'm sure you've seen it as well. 
This approach can rob the family and the patient time, precious time, of enjoying each other's presence in a, in a truly present fashion. Uh, religion can be the pink elephant in the room when we are not allowed to speak truth uh, that the patient is dying. Denial is often cloaked in religious language. Um, as chaplains, it falls in our purview to talk with family openly about their situation and get down to the root of some of that denial. Um, sometimes we're successful, sometimes not. But in the end, reality always wins. And then the family is left with picking up the pieces of their faith and trying to put them back together in a piece that, that is functional. Um, parental use of religion, spirituality, and medical decision making. All of us have resources that we draw on spiritually and religiously, internal resources and external resources. The internal resources are prayer, personal relationship with the sacred, deeply held spiritual beliefs, and external would be counsel from religious authority, your church, your uh, synagogue, um, your community, books, sacred scriptures. Um, as, uh, as Andrew talked about the three C's, I, I always emphasize the fourth C is to connect. Um, we help patients connect both internally and externally. Um, many people find, people find it difficult to pray for themselves, so we pray on their behalf. Um, people feel disconnected or forgotten by God. We try to help reconnect. Uh, we also connect people from other faiths to their religious leaders, priests, imams, Jehovah's Witness representatives. Um, sometimes parents intentionally disconnect. They choose not to be connected, which is fine. Um, they feel that God turned his back on them and they're going to turn their back on God. And that's, that's, I've been there. Um, after my cancer experience, I quit praying. I literally quit praying. I was not a chaplain at the time. <laughs> after my cancer, I had leukemia. After my cancer, I, as I was processing what had happened to me, I quit praying for six years because I was searching and trying to understand. And I was, I was in my world 30 years ago, I was the only person that I knew with leukemia that survived. So I had the survivor go going on. So I was trying to emotionally and spiritually process what had happened. It takes time. <clears throat> the, uh, the internal and the external resources, I think of these things as an anchor uh, that holds us down in the midst of the storm, through an illness especially. The waves crash upon you, and I see these things as an anchor. Um, and what, what hurts me, as obviously I'm a religious person, um, uh, I know that so much of the world is, is disconnecting from their faith communities, and I see that as, as losing a coping resource. I see that as losing a part of their anchor, that when the waves do come and the waves do hit you, that, that same support is not quite there. But obviously, that's my worldview. Family's perspective. The family's understanding of why their child has become ill may draw on religious roots. Parents are trying to make meaning or make sense out of the illness. Um, in cases of chronic or life-threatening illness, cases of disability, parents may see themselves as being tested or even punished. Um, we all do this. If we can make something about us, then we can have influence over that. And that actually gives us a sense of control. You know, how often have you heard, I, I wish I could be in the bed instead of my child. Um, it, you know, if we think that we can control it even just a little bit, we'll do it for the sake of our children. <clears throat> Parents may define major losses as part of a greater picture or a divine plan. The karmic traditions may interpret such losses in relation to earlier lives. Uh, when Victor Frankl, oh, Victor Frankl was right, finding meaning is critical, but in peace it's even harder. When it's your child lying there, it's, it's even harder and it takes longer. Um, I can't give anyone their meaning or their purpose, but we can walk alongside them and help them discover for themselves. Um, chaplain training, in our chaplain training, the CPE that Andrew spoke of, we have to do our own soul searching, our own soul wrenching, our, everybody has a spiritual journey, and we, are, we get accustomed to, what is that journey like for me? How dare I go help somebody else if I've not done it for myself first? It, it equips us with the tools to do that.
parents may use religious therapies, either as complements or alternatives, to biomedical therapies, prayer, anointing, laying on of hands, visits to the sick, pilgrimage, petitions to the saints, retrieval of a lost soul, the undoing of a curse, amulets and icons, um, all good things. But sometimes, and only sometimes, uh, folks use the religious and spiritual therapies that are not helpful, that are actually hurtful to children. That, this has happened. So in 1944, Prince v. Massachusetts, um, it says that uh, parents are not free to endanger their children's health in the name of religion. Uh, I'm sure you have many case studies that do this in your world as well. Um, according to the case, adults uh, willing to endanger their own health in the name of religion are free to do so, but parents are not at liberty to make that choice for their children. <coughs> and, and only a related uh, uh, we have seen a rise in the anti-vax and the anti-science beliefs through the pandemic, and nowhere else do we see more of that than in, in the pediatric world. Religious beliefs has been cited by some to explain their rationale. If you Google um, scriptures that people use to substantiate their religious objections to vaccination, it's a long list. I think it's very much taken out of context, but it is a long list. Um, so it's out there. Uh, for the child's understanding, religious traditions can play multiple roles in the lives of children, such as providing structures for moral development, socialization of the child into different ideals of a personhood and behavior. In addition, they may influence a child's ideas about sickness, suffering, coping, and healing, issues of direct relevance to pediatric practice and to child well-being. Uh, chaplains come alongside the family and support them in whatever faith tradition they hail from. Even if the family is not religious or, or spiritual, we still come alongside. We, we hope that they will allow us to come alongside, not to be spiritual, but to be emotional, be that emotional support. <clears throat> we do this without judgment, um, but only to be supportive and uh, um, uh, sorry. Trying to figure out how many stories to tell. <laughs> tell the stories. Tell the stories. Uh, who are the experts that we look to? Um, one of the best known authors on children's spirituality is the faith development theory of James Fowler. Fowler proposes that the development of children's faith occurs in stages related to Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development, Lawrence Colbert's theory of moral development, and Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. Um, in Fowler's model, children are seen as becoming capable of increasingly abstract and multi-perspective religious thinking as they grow older. They usually carry the faith of their family, but in, as they get older, they begin to explore their own identity and their own faith. A uh, quick poll. How often do you have patients reference their beliefs, their spirituality, God? <coughs> Yeah. How does it come up? Is it different every time? They just mention it. They mention it. They said if we're going to church or they talk about it. It's part of their strength, part of their anchor. I'll usually ask if that's if spirituality plays a role in their coping or in their healing or in their support system. If they don't, um, sometimes I'll kind of throw it out there. Like I may say. You know, a lot of people have different coping strategies. Some it might be a faith, some it might be exercise, some it might be, you know, um, prayer. So you know, and see if they grab any. If they don't say they have any, and then I'll explore it further. And sometimes, um, and I find this more in, um, I think, our Hispanic communities have very strong faith-based and very accepting like you so you're trying to offer like services and you know this is available and this is available to help you and the answer in some of the worst situations was this is what god gave me and this is what i will deal with and, and i was like yes but there's other things that we can help you with but sometimes it was it's almost like this is my lot in life and i must accept it very much strikes to the world view, how to, and how do they see God, their theological view. Um, does God give us illness that, you know, is God punishing God? Um, in these situations, please make referrals, consults to chaplains. We obviously love to be with people on their worst day um, as they're struggling with these things. 
in the occupation world? Oh, well, not yet. The question was, uh, uh, for people online, was uh, do we have chaplains in the outpatient world? Not so much. Um, but please, uh, as they come in, as they possibly get worse, if they do have to come to the hospital, we are here. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I would encourage them to connect with their local pastor. Hopefully they're already bringing in their local pastor. Maybe it's and maybe, possibly, powers that be. Uh, we, we are <laughs> constantly having conversations in that same vein. Uh, so there's a as research as goal. Research goal. Research goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Grant to cover it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm here for it. Dr. Yeah. O'Neill is on it. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, it's, um, as the, the focus over the last couple of years in medicine, from my perspective, has been kind of this community resource and, and prevention from being in the hospital. And so part of that, uh, there was a, and I'm sorry to steal your time, but there was an interesting study out of Baylor, uh, and they showed um, some lowering of 30-day readmission rates and uh, pieces that you can put a dollar value on, uh, which uh, administration loves when you can do that. Uh, and so we're, we're continuing to advocate for um, as much as we can. Okay. Sorry. No. Sounds like you have people in this room who would support that, so. <laughs> I'm going to share a story, um, and, and this is uh, how one way that chaplains can be useful. Um, so uh, in the NICU, uh, twins. Uh, one of the twins died, the other child is still living, and uh, um, mom and dad, it's, uh, they're coping very, very differently. Um, mom is in the throes of her grief for the child that is deceased. Dad says he has moved on and is just trying to be hopeful for the child that is still with us. Um, and they really butt heads, and um, dad has to remove himself, and uh, that's best buddy. Um, goes to attend to him, the best buddy comes back, uh, obviously speaking for dad, and dad has been telling mom this, but the buddy has come back to reinforce it, that uh, basically you can't grieve, you need to focus on the child that's with us and speak, speak hope, speak life, because if we speak death, it'll happen. And, and so it's just putting all this pressure on mom, and I'm, it's just the three of us. Um, and the uh, um, putting all this pressure on mom, stop crying, stop shouting, you know, stop. And this is getting close to spiritual abuse of my, you know, you can't stop. So she's going to grieve. She's going to, whether you want her to or not, she's going to grieve. And so, um, as uh, you know, when Andrew said with the three, say, if necessary, we challenge. And I felt it necessary to challenge the buddy. I said, you know, theologically speaking, you're wrong. We don't always do that. <laughs> but theologically speaking, we just can't speak somebody to die. You know, she's, everything that she's feeling, everything that she's saying is 100% normal. Um, and, I, I, you know, it th we think that we have the power just by the, uh, the words that, of our mouth, the, the thoughts that we have, that it truly can kill a person. But obviously, you know, so it's amazing the spiritual worldviews that come into the hospital, the beliefs, that, the, the strongly held beliefs that people have. Um, and it's when it's when I really felt the mom being uh, pressured to stop doing what she needs to do. Um, she can't focus. It, it's hard to hold grief and hope simultaneously. And the grief was so heavy, she couldn't get to the hope. She, had to go, she has to go through the grief, and obviously she still hopes to the best for her son, obviously, that's still with us. Um, so, the, and these hard conversations, and it was a very short conversation, really, but th this is why we're here, to really engage in those hard conversations when people are truly trying to exert, exert, exert pressure um, on their loved ones. Um, but there's a bigger picture, and hopefully we can always bring that. Uh, understand in your book club, I only learned of this book when I was preparing for this talk, and apparently the book club that you have going on right now for the residents and the staff, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Ann Fadiman. 
um, uh, an old case of uh, an account of a mom family from Laos with a child diagnosed with epilepsy. It details how the medical establishment and the family could not overcome cultural and spiritual barriers to provide good care. Um, and, uh, and the Hmong culture, the cause of epilepsy, is spiritual. It is a spiritual reason for an illness. An, epi an epileptic seizure is a demonstration that the soul has left the body. So they were working closely with their shaman, but they were also working closely with the medical establishment, and they were trying to weave that road together, and it did not go well. A series of failures culminated in a grand mal seizure, and then decades of living in a persistent vegetative state, and eventual death at the age of 30. And, and there's a case after case, situation after situation, where their spiritual needs were not met is a communication barrier, a cultural barrier. So it's uh, just a good case study for all of us if, we have, if you have time to read that. And I um, share my own personal story if that's our right. Any questions so far at this point? <clears throat> In your announcement that it's not, um, it's a different religion and you can't get somebody easily in there from that specific religion. How much uh, commonality do you think there is with your training and what you can provide to different cultures if you can't get somebody specifically in? Yeah, so for the best examples that I can give are, are like through COVID, where there weren't a lot of availability to get people into the hospital from other faith traditions. Um, one of our local imams was told by his physician not to go to the hospital. Um, and so when we had a specific Islamic requests, we, we have some physicians in-house that will make themselves available. Uh, but but for us, it comes back to that piece of connection uh, and people want to be seen and heard first and foremost. And so um, th there are times where we will let them know that an imam or a rabbi or uh, whatever faith leader is has been contacted, we, we've tried our best, and uh, that they are unavailable uh, and that we are happy to try to meet their, their needs the best we can and very infrequently will someone say no thanks i'm i'm fine the 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 act of being present and listening usually meets some level of base needs um there are some lines i'm not catholic i cannot give sacrament of the sick or communion to a catholic patient um and so when a priest is unavailable um we yeah. do the best that we can uh, but there are just certain things that some faith traditions just won't accept or receive. And so there's some lines that we try to be cognizant of. Um, but most people just want comfort. Yeah, and, and they're often great about teaching us along the way to say, I, I don't know, um, I don't speak Hebrew, I took a semester of it, um, and so working with um, Jewish patients, uh, they, they will often say, well, I, I can lead uh, and, and be with them as they pray in, in Hebrew. It is, yeah, I was, I was just going to add, as Andrew said, let them teach us, and that's okay. Um, and most people, most people, Want, just want that emotional connection, and uh, and they know, and and people that have a belief in God, in a higher power. I've had countless people tell me, um, it doesn't really matter what denomination you are, it doesn't really matter what religion, just believe, just believe that something is going to help my child get better, and that's really the, the if you have that, that's enough commonality that people are willing to say okay. <laughs> And I presume the literature that you reference shows a significant positive correlation with outcomes or more so acceptance of the journey, the literature specifically. Yeah, so there's uh, certainly positive correlation with uh, healthy, <coughs> healthy coping mechanisms uh, in, in faith traditions. Um, 
and then the, there, he talked about the unhealthy coping mechanisms. Uh, when it swings that direction, then the outcomes get worse because then, then you stop, um, stop kind of in conjunction with modern medicine. That's where we see kind of these negative pieces and, and the um, Surgeon General's epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Um, that, that's where we see some of those outcomes get worse when, when they pull back from everything and, and we just see more and more of that in the social media age. Thank you. I'm uh, going to share a personal story. I know we're getting close to our time. <clears throat> I have two children. They're 9 and 11. Uh, my daughter, Emma, she has uh, what's called xeroderma pigmentosum, XP. And uh, she, there's eight different types of XP. There's XP, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. She has XP, C. Um, and uh, so XP is... Uh, autosomal recessive condition whereby this the cells cannot repair from any ultraviolet exposure. So she is at a 10,000% increased chance of having skin cancer. She will have skin, skin cancer at some point in her life. Um, it has many other comorbidities. Hopefully her generation will be the first that lives a, a long life, a regular long life. Um, it has definitely affected life, uh, the length of life. Um, so that's a lot to live with. Um, you look for God everywhere you can in these situations. She's great. She's happy, healthy today. Um, she's never had cancer. She's had uh, six biopsies. They've none have ever come back uh, positive for cancer. Um, but you look for God anywhere that you can. When we were in the process of being diagnosed, when Emma was in the process of being diagnosed when she was two, um, uh, Dr. Emily Doherty, the geneticist, we went to her. And I think that she knew just from looking at Emma that she had XP. Because it turns out that Dr. Doherty did part of her, one of her rotations, one of her fellowships, one, some of her training was literally at the NIH in the XP lab, <laughs> working with Dr. Kramer and his team researching XP. And, and XP has a classic look. So I think just looking at Emma and, and just the massive freckles that she had, I think she knew. But she had to make the consult to the NIH, and she did. And so it just got us to the right people that much faster. Um, you know, when you're in that moment of desperation, you're looking look for a rock climber, you're looking for anything, the smallest, le the smallest ledge to hang your life on. And, um, and, and you can always find it. Um, as an aside, her, her older brother, Joshua, has celiac. So in my family, we can't have bread or sun. <laughs> like, oh. So the, the building blocks of life, we struggle with, but they are happy. They are healthy. We're we we're, we're just they're, they're they fight like cats and dogs. They're great. They love each other. Um, uh, it's a good life. Uh, but when she was first first diagnosed, we literally had to shutter every window um, because even sunlight streaming into your house is is hurtful, dangerous to a person with XP. So we had to shutter every window um, to drive in the car. I had to put tr black plastic bags in the windows. Um, I wasn't smart enough to just cover the cover the baby seat with a shelf. <laughs> but living in darkness and fear affects you spiritually. It affects how you cope. Um, thankfully, like I said, uh, she's never been diagnosed with cancer. She's she's heard it so often. She's internalized it. If you ask her, because she has the scars from the biopsies, and you don't biopsy a three-year-old awake. You always have to put them to sleep um, because they won't sit still. So every time she's been, you know, put to sleep twice. And uh, if you ask her, she's had cancer, but she's not because she's internalized it. Um, so from the age of two until she was five, she really didn't articulate. She was observing, but she really didn't articulate because she didn't know how to put it into words. But, uh, you know, with the stages of faith and we get older and we start to understand, um, the questions started to come. Daddy, why do I have XP? Um, am I being punished? Was I bad? Um, why are people laughing at me? Why am I different? Uh, does God hate me? 
um, I didn't do a good job. I didn't give a picture. And I didn't give do, give a good job uh, explaining what her daily routine is like. She can never go into the world without gloves on. She she doesn't have an inch of skin exposed to the world. She has special hats that literally cover her. Um, always pants. Ex, always extra leg warmers, boots. Uh, even when it's 100 degrees. So um, she has two different hats that she wears. One literally looks like a space helmet. Uh, it's got a UV protective shield in the front, um, just like a space astronaut. Uh, the other looks like a beekeeper's hat, and it's uh, more open under the bottom, but UV bounces, so it can bounce up and under. Uh, so that's the that, that's the less preferred, but the older she gets, the less that she wants to wear the space helmet. We call it the fan hat because it's got a fan that pushes air into the, for the circulation. Um, and so she looks different. We go to the playground and she can't run and play, and but she looks different. And in here, it would, be, it would be safe. These LED lights are safe. Even light bulbs emit ultraviolet light. So we have to have an IEP with the school system that they have to tend. They have to change light bulbs. Her world is protected. Everywhere that we go, church, school, home, that's our bubble. Going out to eat at a restaurant? No, we, we just usually, unless I've been there and I have a light meter that can, is it safe? You know, it tells me how much ultraviolet light is in the air. Um, and so we know safe places that we can go. And then when you, <laughs> the gluten exposure, so we don't go out either. <laughs> um, so Emma is willing to ask anybody and everybody these questions, people that she trusts. Um, mom's answer was, God gave it to you, God let you have it because you're strong enough to handle it. He knows, God knows how strong you are. God knows how strong you are going to be, and she is strong. She is resilient. She's the strongest of all of us. Um, she, uh, you have it because you're going to be able to help other people. I don't agree with those reasons. As in my training, in my world, in my understanding of God, God does not give us illness. Um, God does not make bad things happen. So, uh, me and mom are not together, but uh, mom took Emma to her pastor, and I wasn't there, um, but what I got out of that, they did a great exercise where the pastor took a long string that went well beyond the room, I had her pull the string all the way out, and then, you know, they tacked it down, and then at the, at the front end, just this little point, just this little point where the tack is. This, that's your entire life right there. And the rest of it is eternity when you get to heaven. And won't it be so great when you get to heaven? You know, everything good that's going to, it's going to override all, these, all this bad that you're experiencing right now. And again, in my training, my worldview, and my understanding of God, I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. Does it help a nine-year-old girl trying to, trying to cope with her condition, lifelong condition? No, it does not. I, no, it does not help. Um, Dad's answer. <laughs> um, God did not give it to you. Actually, me and Mom gave it to you. <laughs> it's an autosomal condition. <clears throat> me and Mom, I'm a carrier. I didn't know it. Mom's a carrier. Never knew it. Making babies, we found out. We have it. Um, so her next question was, why didn't you give it to John? <laughs> it's, a, it's a rational question. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have my Sunday school answers. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Bad things happen to good people. Um, as doctors, I'm, I'm sure you don't like to say I don't know. As a daddy, I don't like to say I don't know. <coughs> I have to. Um, and uh, you know, my truth, I know we got to go. I'm so sorry. Um, my truth that I that we live with Emma every day is that it sucks. We are allowed to say it sucks for XP. <laughs> and um, we're always going to be there for her. We're going to give her everything that she needs. We're going to help her every step of the way. And uh, and God is too. And after after all that Emma has heard from all these different people that she's asking. She is formulating her faith every day, more and more every day, year by year. She's hearing these voices, and eventually she's going to come up with her own answer. 
and uh, she's an amazing, amazing little girl. And I'm happy to be her dad. Thanks for your time. Um, I hope something that we discussed today, me and Andrew, has piqued something and would love to continue conversations further. Um, appreciate your time. I was ready to jump because I know it's time, but if anybody does have any questions, I'm happy to entertain any other questions. Yes, sir. Not to make this go long, but uh, I have a story and then a question. So the story is, I think you came in, just to, just to sort of say, kind of put an explanation point on what you said. So my daughter was uh, intubated in the hospital and uh, was getting ready to go get a tracheostomy. And my wife was there in the room by herself. She, my daughter was 21, I think at the time, 22. And then you came in and she was didn't know what to, you know, how to grapple with it. I think you, I think it was you, told her that letter to the Psalms of lament, mm -hmm. and just that she could express her concerns, you know, out loud. And I think that helped her a lot, just to give her, you know, meaning and suffering, like you were talking about. The second thing is my son actually, kind of as a, as why she passed away, and uh, watching that is now in his CPE at uh, DC in. Uh, MedStar Hospital, but he has to attend when he's on call and stuff. He goes to the codes, and I asked him why, because the usually the family is not in there during the code, and he said he actually goes for the doctors. And so, tell me if, if you could express like what your care is for that. Do you have to do that, or yeah? So, so we go to all of the the code. We go to every code blue that we can. Um, I won't say that 100% because just depending on what else is going on in the hospital. Um, some hospital systems like to have the family not at bedside for codes, but to bring family to see what is happening in a code. Um, in, in the pediatric world, it's a little bit different. Parents don't want to be away from their children. Uh, and so part of what we're going for is to see if there's family. Uh, to be supportive if we can, uh, and then to help communicate between the family and the physicians, because uh, sometimes codes can be anywhere from five minutes to an hour and 15 is kind of the longest that I've been a part of. And But there there is a piece of staff support, um, and that's part of some of the grant writing that I've done uh, for Code Lavender, and physicians get pieces of that in the inpatient world, um, we have some aromatherapy pieces, we've got some healthy snacks and not so healthy snacks, some art modalities, information on EAP that we'll kind of take to them and give them anywhere from five to ten minutes to debrief if they are interested. Um, physicians get the least of that because you all are just so busy and it goes from I'm working this code to I'm back down in the ED taking care of the next patient that is coming through. Um, but for um, some of the difficult situations over here, we've been brought in to help facilitate some debriefing. And so um, that is part of it. Um, and at UVA is where I knew that it started the pause after a code that is ended in death. Um, the, the chaplain will initiate just a 20 to 30 second moment of silence uh, to acknowledge the life that has been lost and to honor that life. And, and bring a little bit of humanity back into that piece because there are other patients to take care of and, and we go from death to this next piece and when there's no break, it just becomes that much more taxing on us and, and everybody kind of deals with it differently, but, but giving just that 30 seconds of acknowledgement of what has been lost uh, and the work that the team has done to try to provide care, I would say is the, the rationale between of having a chaplain go to all the codes. Good, thank you. Rick, does the um, from your son's perspective, does do the physicians or the staff seem to really appreciate that? Um, he hasn't really talked about that aspect okay. much. Okay. I was just curious because I thought I found that interesting. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. My experience has been get the families out, mm -hmm. and you know we sort of focus on the situation, and then mm -hmm. so I mean he mm -hmm. he said he's just there for them for the most part, and. Yeah. He hasn't really talked about too many conversations that he's had, but he does a lot of the sort of memorial care that um, is, is more of what he's been involved in, like trying to 
help honor the, the person who's passed and have the family sort of express memories mm -hmm. of that just so they can, you know, if they want it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, I was going to ask also just how you deal, you know, because when he says he comes home, he has to sort of watch mindless television or, you know, do something completely different because he said it's, it's kind of overwhelming sometimes after a full day of that. Yeah, and, and part of my ritual, uh, taking off my badge and leaving work at work, uh, is is part of my. It's the first thing I do to disconnect from the hardship. You know, when when you're walking with somebody, really every day is is somebody's worst day in the hospital, and so we get brought in. Uh, we don't get brought in for a lot of happy situations. I think in seven years I've been a part of two baptisms with labor delivery that weren't uh, some sort of fetal demise situation. Uh, and so just a lot of grief and loss. Uh, so mindless things, I, I do a lot of audiobooks. Uh, I do a lot of home improvement projects and keep myself busy. Um, and then have my own kind of coping pieces with therapists and uh, helping to unpack uh, what we do day in, day out. It's important. And I would just add, just piggyback on that. So we go from the worst case in the NICU to the worst case in the PICU to the worst case in oncology to the worst case on palliative care. So it's, we just don't have the, we have the worst case on eight different units. Um, and so at the end of the day, emotionally, that is heavy. Um, in my residency, uh, um, uh, I was at Golden Corral just eating by myself and I just started to cry. You know, because it, the reality of what this life, what this work is gonna be um, hit me hard. And uh, as I was thinking about the traumas that had been in just a few hours earlier, um, and as you know, we grow in our coping, and you know, it's, uh, uh, it gets easier so, somehow. <laughs> Some days. <laughs> but, and we talk with each other. Yeah. You know, nurses like to debrief with nurses, doctors like to de debrief with doctors generally, chaplains like to debrief. We talk the same language. So you find those people that you can connect with, and it is life giving. Definitely as a physician in the ICU as a person running a lot of those codes, you know, we don't throw parents out if they want to be in the room. Mm -hmm. Most of them sort of want to step out of the way and, and might, um, they look kind of trapped in the corner and you're trying to figure out do they want to stay or do they want a safe person to take them out. So I look for the chaplain to be that person that can stand beside them and help oh, tell them what's going on a little yeah. bit. and if, They'd rather be in a separate room to help escort them there and, and know that they'll help communicate back and forth. And, um, and I do appreciate after the coats when you'll come around and, and check on us and how are you doing and show up with the uh, code lavender wash balls that I love. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they, they do convey that feeling of somebody's thinking about us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you all coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.